Section 2 of Pensée. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek McLaughlin, London, Ontario, Canada. Latin language reading by Lenny, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Pensée by Blaise Pascal. Translated by W. F. Trotter. Section 2. THE MISERY OF MAN WITHOUT GOD PART 1 72. MAN'S DISPROPORTION This is where our innate knowledge leads us. If it be not true, there is no truth in man, and if it be true, he finds therein great cause for humiliation, being compelled to abase himself in one way or another. And since he cannot exist without this knowledge, I wish that, before entering on deeper researches into nature, he would consider her both seriously and at leisure, that he would reflect upon himself also, and knowing what proportion there is. Let man then contemplate the whole of nature in her full and grand majesty, and turn his vision from the low objects which surround him. Let him gaze on that brilliant light, set like an eternal lamp to illumine the universe. Let the earth appear to him a point in comparison with the vast circle described by the sun, and let him wonder at the fact that this vast circle is itself but a very fine point in comparison with that described by the stars in their revolution round the firmament. But if our view be arrested there, let our imagination pass beyond, it will sooner exhaust the power of conception than nature that of supplying material for conception. The whole visible world is only an imperceptible atom in the ample bosom of nature. No idea approaches it. We may enlarge our conceptions beyond all imaginable space. We only produce atoms in comparison with the reality of things. It is an infinite sphere, the center of which is everywhere, the circumference nowhere. In short, it is the greatest sensible mark of the almighty power of God that imagination loses itself in that thought. Returning to himself, let man consider what he is in comparison with all existence. Let him regard himself as lost in this remote corner of nature. And from the little cell in which he finds himself lodged, I mean the universe, let him estimate at their true value the earth, kingdoms, cities, and himself. What is a man in the infinite? But to show him another prodigy equally astonishing, let him examine the most delicate things he knows. Let a bite be given him, with its minute body and parts incomparably more minute, limbs with their joints, veins in the limbs, blood in the veins, humors in the blood, drops in the humors, vapors in the drops. Dividing these last things again, let him exhaust his powers of conception, and let the last object at which he can arrive be now that of our discourse. Perhaps he will think that here is the smallest point in nature. I will let him see therein a new abyss. I will paint for him not only the visible universe, but all that he can conceive of nature's immensity in the womb of this abridged atom. Let him see therein an infinity of universes, each of which has its firmament, its planets, its earth, in the same proportion as in the visible world, in each earth animals, and in the last mites, in which he will find again all that the first had finding still in these others the same thing without end and without cessation. Let him lose himself in wonders as amazing in their littleness as the others in their vastness. For who will not be astounded at the fact that our body, which a little ago was imperceptible in the universe, itself imperceptible in the bosom of the whole, is now a colossus, a world, or rather a whole, in respect of the nothingness which we cannot reach? He who regards himself in this light will be afraid of himself, and observing himself sustained in the body given him by nature between those two abysses of the infinite and nothing, will tremble at the sight of these marvels, and I think that, as his curiosity changes into admiration, he will be more disposed to contemplate them in silence than to examine them with presumption. For in fact what is man in nature? A nothing in comparison with the infinite, an all in comparison with the nothing a mean between nothing and everything. Since he is infinitely removed from comprehending the extremes, the end of things and their beginning are hopelessly hidden from him in an impenetrable secret. He is equally incapable of seeing the nothing from which he was made, and the infinite in which he is swallowed up. 
What will he do then but perceive the appearance of the middle of things, in an eternal despair of knowing either their beginning or their end? All things proceed from the nothing and are born towards the infinite. Who will follow these marvelous processes? The author of these wonders understands them. None other can do so. Through failure to contemplate these infinites, men have rashly rushed into the examination of nature as though they bore some proportion to her. It is strange that they have wished to understand the beginnings of things, and thence to arrive at the knowledge of the whole, with a presumption as infinite as their object. For surely this design cannot be formed without presumption, or without a capacity infinite like nature. If we are well informed, we understand that, as nature has graven her image and that of her author on all things, they almost all partake of her double infinity. Thus we see that all the sciences are infinite in the extent of their researches. For who doubts that geometry, for instance, has an infinite infinity of problems to solve? They are also infinite in the multitude and fineness of their premises, for it is clear that those which are put forward as ultimate are not self-supporting, but are based on others which, again having others for their support, do not permit of finality. But we represent some as ultimate for reason, in the same way as in regard to material objects we call that an indivisible point beyond which our senses can no longer perceive anything, although by nature it is infinitely divisible. Of these two infinites of science, that of greatness is the most palpable, and hence a few persons have pretended to know all things. I will speak of the whole, said Democritus. But the infinitely little is the least obvious. Philosophers have much oftener claimed to have reached it, and it is here they have all stumbled. This has given rise to such common titles as First Principles, Principles of Philosophy, and the like, as ostentatious in fact, though not in appearance, as that one which blinds us. De omnis cibili. Footnote concerning everything knowable, the title under which Pico della Mirandola announced the nine hundred propositions which he undertook to defend in 1486. End of footnote. We naturally believe ourselves far more capable of reaching the center of things than of embracing their circumference. The visible extent of the world visibly exceeds us, but as we exceed little things, we think ourselves more capable of knowing them. And yet we need no less capacity for attaining the nothing than the all. Infinite capacity is required for both, and it seems to me that whoever shall have understood the ultimate principles of being might also attain to the knowledge of the infinite. The one depends on the other, and one leads to the other. These extremes meet and reunite by force of distance, and find each other in God, and in God alone. Let us then take our compass. We are something, and we are not everything. The nature of our existence hides from us the knowledge of first beginnings which are born of the nothing, and the littleness of our being conceals from us the sight of the infinite. Our intellect holds the same position in the world of thought as our body occupies in the expanse of nature. Limited as we are in every way, this state which holds the mean between two extremes is present in all our impotence. Our senses perceive no extreme. Too much sound deafens us. Too much light dazzles us. Too great distance or proximity hinders our view. Too great length and too great brevity of discourse tend to obscurity. Too much truth is paralyzing. I know some who cannot understand that to take four from nothing leaves nothing. First principles are too self-evident for us. Too much pleasure disagrees with us. Too many concords are annoying in music. Too many benefits irritate us. We wish to have the wherewithal to overpay our debts. Beneficia eo usque laita sunt. Dum videntur ex solvi posse, ubi multum ante venere pro gratia odium reditur. Footnote. Benefits are pleasant while it seems possible to requite them. When they become much greater, they produce hatred rather than gratitude. Tacitus. End of footnote. We feel neither extreme heat nor extreme cold. Excessive qualities are prejudicial to us and not perceptible by the senses. We do not feel but suffer them. Extreme youth and extreme age hinder the mind, as also too much and too little education. In short, extremes are for us as though they were not, and we are not within their notice. They escape us, or we them. This is our true state. This is what makes us incapable of certain knowledge and of absolute ignorance. 
We sail within a vast sphere, ever drifting in uncertainty, driven from end to end. When we think to attach ourselves to any point and to fasten to it, it wavers and leaves us, and if we follow it, it eludes our grasp, slips past us and vanishes forever. Nothing stays for us. This is our natural condition, and yet most contrary to our inclination, we burn with desire to find solid ground and an ultimate sure foundation whereon to build a tower reaching to the infinite. But our whole groundwork cracks, and the earth opens to abysses. Let us, therefore, not look for certainty and stability. Our reason is always deceived by fickle shadows. Nothing can fix the finite between the two infinites, which both enclose and fly from it. If this be well understood, I think that we shall remain at rest, each in the state wherein nature has placed him. As this sphere which has fallen to us as our lot is always distant from either extreme, what matters it that man should have a little more knowledge of the universe? If he has it, he but gets a little higher. Is he not always infinitely removed from the end, and is not the duration of our life equally removed from eternity, even if it lasts ten years longer? In comparison with these infinites, all finites are equal, and I see no reason for fixing our imagination on one more than on another. The only comparison which we make of ourselves to the finite is painful to us. If man made himself the first object of study, he would see how incapable he is of going further. How can a part know the whole? But he may perhaps aspire to know at least the parts to which he bears some proportion. But the parts of the world are all so related and linked to one another that I believe it impossible to know one without the other and without the whole. Man, for instance, is related to all he knows. He needs a place wherein to abide, time through which to live, motion in order to live, elements to compose him, warmth and food to nourish him, air to breathe. He sees light, he feels bodies, in short he is in a dependent alliance with everything. To know man, then, it is necessary to know how it happens that he needs air to live, and, to know the air, we must know how it is thus related to the life of man, etc. Flame cannot exist without air, therefore, to understand the one, we must understand the other. Since everything, then, is cause and effect, dependent and supporting, mediate and immediate, and all is held together by a natural, though imperceptible, chain, which binds together things most distant and most different, I hold it equally impossible to know the parts without knowing the whole, and to know the whole without knowing the parts in detail. The eternity of things in itself, or in God, must also astonish our brief duration. The fixed and constant immobility of nature, in comparison with the continual change which goes on within us, must have the same effect. And what completes our incapability of knowing things is the fact that they are simple, and that we are composed of two opposite natures, different in kind, soul and body. For it is impossible that our rational part should be other than spiritual, and if any one maintain that we are simply corporeal, this would far more exclude us from the knowledge of things, there being nothing so inconceivable as to say that matter knows itself. It is impossible to imagine how it should know itself. So, if we are simply material, we can know nothing at all, and if we are composed of mind and matter, we cannot know perfectly things which are simple, whether spiritual or corporeal. Hence, it comes that almost all philosophers have confused ideas of things, and speak of material things in spiritual terms, and of spiritual things in material terms. For they say boldly that bodies have a tendency to fall, that they seek after their center, that they fly from destruction, that they fear the void, that they have inclinations, sympathies, antipathies, all of which attributes pertain only to mind. And in speaking of minds, they consider them as in a place, and attribute them movement from one place to another, and these are qualities which belong only to bodies. Instead of receiving the ideas of these things in their purity, we color them with our own qualities, and stamp with our composite being all the simple things which we contemplate. Who would not think, seeing us compose all things of mind and body, but that this mixture would be quite intelligible to us? Yet it is the very thing we least understand. Man is to himself the most wonderful object in nature, for he cannot conceive what the body is, still less what the mind is, and least of all how a body should be united to a mind. This is the consummation of his difficulties, and yet it is his very being. 
modus quo corporibus ad haerent spiritus, comprehendi ab hominibus non potest, et hoc tamen homo est. Footnote. The manner in which spirits are united to bodies cannot be understood by men, yet such is man. St. Augustine. End of footnote. Finally, to complete the proof of our weakness, I shall conclude with these two considerations. 82. Imagination. It is that deceitful part in man, that mistress of error and falsity, the more deceptive that she is not always so, for she would be an infallible rule of truth if she were an infallible rule of falsehood. But being most generally false, she gives no sign of her nature, impressing the same character on the true and the false. I do not speak of fools, I speak of the wisest men, and it is among them that the imagination has the great gift of persuasion. Reason protests in vain, it cannot set a true value on things. This arrogant power, the enemy of reason, who likes to rule and dominate it, has established in man a second nature to show how all-powerful she is. She makes men happy and sad, healthy and sick, rich and poor. She compels reason to believe, doubt and deny. She blunts the senses or quickens them. She has her fools and sages. And nothing vexes us more than to see that she fills her devotees with a satisfaction far more full and entire than does reason. Those who have a lively imagination are a great deal more pleased with themselves than the wise can reasonably be. They look down upon men with haughtiness. They argue with boldness and confidence, others with fear and diffidence, and this gaiety of countenance often gives them the advantage in the opinion of the hearers. Such favor have the imaginary wise in the eyes of judges of like nature. Imagination cannot make fools wise, but she can make them happy, to the envy of reason, which can only make its friends miserable. The one covers them with glory, the other with shame. What but this faculty of imagination dispenses reputation, awards respect and veneration to persons, works, laws, and the great? How insufficient are all the riches of the earth without her consent? Would you not say that this magistrate, whose venerable age commands the respect of a whole people, is governed by pure and lofty reason, and that he judges causes according to their true nature without considering those mere trifles which only affect the imagination of the weak? See him go to sermon, full of devout zeal, strengthening his reason with the ardor of his love. He is ready to listen with exemplary respect. Let the preacher appear, and let nature have given him a hoarse voice, or a comical cast of countenance, or let his barber have given him a bad shave, or let by chance his dress be more dirty than usual, then, however great the truth he announces, I wager our senator lose his gravity." If the greatest philosopher in the world find himself upon a plank wider than actually necessary, but hanging over a precipice, his imagination will prevail, though his reason convince him of his safety. Many cannot bear the thought without a cold sweat. I will not state all its effects. Everyone knows that the sight of cats or rats, the crushing of a coal, etc., may unhinge the reason. The tone of voice affects the wisest, and changes in the force of a discourse or a poem. Love or hate alters the aspect of justice. How much greater confidence has an advocate, retained with a large fee in the justice of his cause? How much better does his bold manner make his case appear to the judges, deceived as they are by appearances? How ludicrous is reason, blown with a breath in every direction! I should have to enumerate almost every action of men who scarce waver save under her assaults. For reason has been obliged to yield and the wisest reason takes as her own principles those which the imagination of man has everywhere rashly introduced. He who would follow reason only would be deemed foolish by the generality of men. We must judge by the opinion of the majority of mankind. Because it has pleased them, we must work all day for pleasures seen to be imaginary, and after sleep has refreshed our tired reason, we must forthwith start up and rush after phantoms, and suffer the impressions of this mistress of the world. This is one of the sources of error, but it is not the only one. Our magistrates have known well this mystery. Their red robes, and ermine in which they wrap themselves like furry cats, the courts in which they administer justice, the fleur de lis, and all such august apparel were necessary. If the physicians had not their cassocks and their mules, if the doctors had not their square caps and their robes four times too wide, they would never have duped the world which cannot resist so original an appearance. 
If magistrates had true justice, and if physicians had the true art of healing, they would have no occasion for square caps. The majesty of these sciences would of itself be venerable enough. But having only imaginary knowledge, they must employ those silly tools that strike the imagination which, with which they have to deal, and thereby, in fact, they inspire respect. Soldiers alone are not disguised in this manner, because indeed their part is the most essential. They establish themselves by force, the others by show. Therefore our kings seek out no disguises. They do not mask themselves in extraordinary costumes to appear such, but they are accompanied by guards and halberdiers, those armed and red-faced puppets who have hands and power for them alone, those trumpets and drums which go before them, and those legions round about them, make the stoutest tremble. They have not dress only, they have might. A very refined reason is required to regard as an ordinary man the Grand Turk in his superb seraglio, surrounded by forty thousand janissaries. We cannot even see an advocate in his robe and with his cap on his head without a favorable opinion of his ability. The imagination disposes of everything. It makes beauty, justice, and happiness, which is everything in the world. I should much like to see an Italian work, of which I know only the title, which alone is worth many books. Della opinione regina del mondo. Footnote. On opinion, queen of the world. The book has not been certainly identified. End of footnote. I approve of the book without knowing it, save the evil in it, if any. These are pretty much the effects of the deceptive faculty, which seems to have been expressly given us to lead us into necessary error. We have, however, many other sources of error. Not only are old impressions capable of misleading us, the charms of novelty have the same power. Hence arise all the disputes of men who taunt each other either with following the false impressions of childhood or with running rashly after the new. Who keeps the due mean? Let him appear and prove it. There is no principle, however natural to us from infancy, which may not be made to pass for a false impression, either of education or of sense. Because, say some, you have believed from childhood that a box was empty when you saw nothing in it, you have believed in the possibility of a vacuum. This is an illusion of your senses, strengthened by custom, which science must correct. Because, say others, you have been taught at school that there is no vacuum, you have perverted your common sense, which clearly comprehended it, and you must correct this by returning to your first state. Which has deceived you, your senses or your education? We have another source of error in diseases. They spoil the judgment and the senses, and if the more serious produce a sensible change, I do not doubt that slighter ills produce a proportionate impression. Our own interest is again a marvelous instrument for nicely putting out our eyes. The justest man in the world is not allowed to be judge in his own cause. I know some who, in order not to fall into the self-love, have been perfectly unjust out of opposition. The sure way of losing a just cause has been to get it recommended to these men by their near relatives. Justice and truth are two such subtle points that our tools are too blunt to touch them accurately. If they reach the point, they either crush it, or lean all round, more on the false than on the true. Man is so happily formed that he has no good of the true, and several excellent of the false. Let us now see how much. But the most powerful cause of error is the war existing between the senses and reason. <laughs>